Hao Tan Hao, good morning. Thank you. Thank you for coming out to this early morning session on the last day of the Summer Davos. Um, I'm Stephen Engel. I'm the Chief uh, North Asia Correspondent uh, for Bloomberg Television. I've been out here about almost 30 years now covering the Asia Pacific, mostly in China. Uh, so um, we're going to have a great conversation, and I want to get your participation, obviously, uh, in this discussion with our distinguished panel members. Uh, we, will, we will have about 20 minutes, maybe 30 minutes or so first. Uh, to discuss amongst ourselves, and then we're going to open it up. Uh, so get your questions ready, and uh, please jump to the microphone and ask the questions. Um, let's go down the list here and, and introduce everyone. Uh, to my left, Jin Ke Yu. Uh, she is the London School of Economics and Political Science Professor of Economics. Thank you very much for your time as well. Uh, then we have, uh, as well, Zhu Wei. He's the International Consultancy Accenture Senior Managing Director and Greater China Chairman. Uh, thank you for joining us as well. Also, Paul Yang, Greater uh, China CEO of Kohlberg, Kravis, and Roberts and Company, uh, private equity perspective on this conversation. And at the end, uh, but not least, of course, Lu Ming Fang, Jeffrey Lu, CEO of China Mengmyo Dairy, CEO of China Mengmyo Group. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, again, of course, the overarching theme and headwind facing the global economy right now is the trade war and is the truce that we have seen. But Despite the truce, and believe me, I was at the G20, and I was here as well Monday morning, and there was, seemed to be a collective sigh of relief among all of you in the audience uh, because of the truce. It relieved that uh, big overhang of doubt. But still, the, many economists are expecting the global economy this year to sink to the lowest, slowest pace of growth since 2009, of course, when we were dealing with the initial effects of the global financial crisis. Morgan Stanley just this week cutting its outlook for global growth. Uncertainty over the US-China trade war is having, quote, and this is after the truce, a more pronounced effect on business <coughs> confidence and economic growth. Uh, Chetan Aya, he is the chief economist at Morgan Stanley. He says risks are decidedly skewed to the downside. So he's a bit pessimistic. Christine Lagarde also over the weekend saying uh, tariffs already implemented are holding back the global economy. Unresolved issues carry a great deal of uncertainty about the future. So keep in mind, there's a truce, but the US tariffs and the Chinese tariffs on each other are still in place. And there is no clear time frame for this issue to be resolved. So that is the big issue. There are many other issues also that we have to uh, deal with, including monetary policy across the globe. Is it a race to zero? Well, let's bring out our guests now. Let's pose the first question to you. Are you optimistic or pessimistic in the short term for the global economy? It's hard um, to be anything but a little bit pessimistic. Uh, truce in the trade war does not mean progress, and we can stay there for a long period of time. We got to ask the question, is this really about making a deal, business, or is this about longer term issues, which is about the Chinese development model, Chinese aspirations and technology competition with the US. On the other side of the world, we have almost a Japanification of Western economies entering a liquidity trap, very low long-term real interest rates and inflation, expected inflation for the next 10 years. Uh, this is, and very little room to cut policy rates going forward. Now this is the time actually when we really need aggregate demand somewhere in the world, perhaps China, but the trade war is not helping, uh, given the uncertainty, with raising the aggregate demand that's deeply needed in the world. So all these factors combined, I think that the Chinese government's response is, look, you know, we're going to loosen our monetary conditions, fiscal conditions, and we have more available levers to, available to the Chinese government than potentially to the US government. So they are ready to handle the negative consequences of the trade war, but that doesn't mean that it won't have an impact on the economy. Yeah, I, I think uh, I, I'm uh, 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 cautiously optimistic. <laughs> the reason I say that is, uh, uh, you know, Accenture actually is one of the world's largest management and uh, technology service company. Uh, we're operating in China and across uh, uh, Asia as well, right? Just by talking to our clients and looking at the economy, uh, you see there's three factors really seriously affecting the, uh, uh, you know, what's going to happen here, right? The first is obviously the geopolitical situation, the trade war, which is now something that the local clients or your companies could have to control. But then the, 
the money, the credit, and also money supply, the fund inflow, outflow, that's uh, also something which being affected by the war economy. Uh, the third element is the, uh, what companies could do, right? The manufacturing capability, the, the supply chain, the uh, basic we look at the technology which also make the things happening. This is the area where we see the companies that are uh, doing that, right? So this is a bit of going to be a, a transformation. Companies will say that our new business model, re, you know, transform themselves to get ready. Can they do this better? Can they do that well? That would really uh, help them to determine their future. We'll get into that issue. Of course, that's a big issue. How about you, Paul? What are you seeing from the private equity position? I mean, you have a terrible problem. All this liquidity. Where did what to do with it? Well, first of all, let's let's put the uh, the, the, the 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 elephant in the room in a proper perspective. Um, <clears throat> from the macroeconomic front, you know, clearly, I think the you know we will see near-term dislocations in supply chains. I, I think this uh, way I've said earlier. Um, but if you think about what is that impact to China, right? China today, if you look at the top 20 exporting country, uh, companies out of China, more than two-thirds of them are actually multinational companies, which means that they have, they're in good positions to reappropriate their global capacity towards this new tariff situation. Um, and in terms of the, for the economy, you know, China's uh, export accounts for about 15% of the GDP. And about a third of that goes to U.S., right? So in a worst-case scenario, even if the tariffs were imposed on the remaining $300 billion, we think the total impact to the labor market displacement would be about $9 million in um, manufacturing jobs and another about $6 million in associated service jobs. Uh, that's a big number, okay? No, not, not to downplay that. But as a percentage of the GDP, I think, that, you know, there are many levers at the government's disposal to mitigate those issues. So while these are near-term concerns, um, and, and I would say many of the people in the audience who run operating companies uh, are seeing near-term slowdowns uh, because of concerns and uncertainties. But if you step back and look at the grand scheme of things, you know, it's not something that's insurmountable. Um, so that, I would say that. Now, from the company level, you know, in, you know, among our portfolio companies, we see this, this latest dislocation it's a risk, but at the same time, an opportunity. Uh, we see companies that are better positioned to handle this change, to take this opportunity to take market share, uh, to gain advantage. Uh, um, um, and we're also seeing good Chinese companies now need to work with international capital, like ourselves, to start thinking about creating manufacturing capabilities outside of China. Um, and so I think we're, we're beginning to see an emergence um, of Chinese multinational companies. And I think we've, we've seen this from other Asian companies going down the same development path, and we should not expect China to be any different. Well, was that an inevitable path anyway, or is that to get around these threats of terrorists? Well, we actually see, we were seeing this uh, for years. I think this latest is just really accelerating that. I think to the same point, you know, China has been making a conscious effort to move into a more consumption-centric economy. I think this latest is also um, uh, an opportunity to accelerate that process as well. Jerry from, uh, Jeffrey, from the dairy perspective? Well, <clears throat> I think um, I'm optimistic because Meng Yu is a young company. We are at 20 years this year, so I have to be optimistic. <laughs> um, but seriously, I think, you know, when you look at the um, situation of, of China, I think the good thing is that consumption the local consumption is, is really driving the economy, which accounts for two-thirds of our you know, GDP. If you look at our industry as a, a fast-moving uh, consumer goods, in the early year in Dowers, people asked me about you know, how do you see, because we are probably one of the indicator if the economy is going well. And I give the answer. I said, if you look at our, our you know, brands and, and, and product portfolio, you will see that our baseline, which is the mainstream um, um, products, are growing at double digit. At the same time, you see our premium line is also growing double digit. Then in the middle, we are not growing. So in the, in the mid price tier, it's not growing, which is very interesting. Meaning that first, you, you do see that the consumption of the base consumption is strong, meaning 
they are consumer, you know, looking for more nutritious products. Right. So they are moving into this category. At the same time, you see premium, which means that the middle class is growing, and they are looking for better and better product. So as, you know, when I look at that, I, I still believe that there is a, a huge amount of opportunity still to grow if you have the right level of innovation, if you continue to drive your value to, to the consumer. At the same time, you know, there are a lot of changes as, as, as you know, our friends just mentioned about trade and also tariff. It has an impact on us as well because we do have a lot of import. Um, there's also a, a, a free trade in our category as well. But if you look at real, the consumption is strong. Um, if you are really in the, in the right position, if you innovate well, it's, it's growing well. So, so I think you know, we should be looking at, you know, from a more optimistic side, but really to look at how we reset the, the problems that we have and to give the engine for our growth. Well, I hear a, a sort of a tone of optimism or cautious optimism. Um, let me read you some comments from Dr. Doom. Noriel Rubini was on Bloomberg Television yesterday morning out of Taiwan. He has a nickname, Dr. Doom, for a good reason. He says, we're going to have to redo the whole tech supply chain. We are in the midst of deglobalization. This divorce is going to get ugly, worse than what happened between China, or excuse me, the United States and the Soviet Union. He says, oil price shock is coming from the Iran tension. The prospect of stagflation is real. He says it's a scary time for the global economy and the risk of recession is very real next year. Now, from the dairy perspective, one on the surface of things who doesn't understand the supply chain issues globally, are you, in a way, global recession proof? I mean, your stock has reflected that. Your stock is up 10% or tenfold, I should say, over the last decade. <laughs> well, um I would say if you look at, uh, dairy used to be a very uh, a regional business, even a country business, right? If you look at globally, 50 years ago, probably dairy is more a country-based business. But if you look at today that, you know, in, in our case, you will see cows are from Australia, machinery for farming are from Europe, right? Afaf is from US. So you start to see that actually Dairy is no longer uh, a country-based, a regional-based business, you know, anymore. It become more a global uh, business. Now, having said that, with the new, I would say, the new era uh, on tariff, on on the trade issues, that you you will see we we look at more um, probably a reset on the global basis, meaning that today you probably will have cows from uh, Uruguay. Right. So, uh, and then you have, you know, you move around all these supply based on the new uh, situation. So you will be a, a reset, meaning that um, this whole again the, the trade will move from country to country, um, but you will never stop uh, this scenario, the, this yeah. situation, because it will be continue to be global. No matter you know if the AFAF is from Spain or it, it is from the U.S., but again, you cannot go back to 50 years ago and to you know be a solely country business again. So I think that's probably the 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 new situation. Let me bring in Ke Yu here. Do we face a prospect of stagflation if there's an oil shock, prices go up? If there's a tariff war escalated, prices go up, but growth slows. Stagflation, 1970s. Nightmare. Um, I am not of the belief that we're going to see inflation uh, picking up anytime soon. I think there's some long-term considerations that we have to face in that uh, pushes downward pressure, including this huge drive for firms to really reduce costs. Um, and, um, you know, the fact that advanced economies wages, because laborers are afraid, right? They're afraid of the future with technology and trade displacing a lot of labor. They're very a weak bargaining power and we need wages to go up to push up inflation. So I think there's some long-term structural issues that will keep it down. I'm not of that view. But if I may, just bring one point that I'm hearing, which is that the trade war or uh, um, trade tension 
is potentially a shock that can accelerate things forward. We've seen this many times before where technology adoption, offshoring, uh, restructuring of firms usually happen when there's a big shock. Because when, you know, normal times people are just doing what they're doing, they won't change. So that's one thing. But I think the longer term issue for China is that U.S. truculence or pushing China is pushing China to strive for self-sufficiency and greater technological independence. And that's an unintended consequence of the trade war that doesn't really serve U.S. purposes. Right. Uh, intellectual property protection, all these that are demanded of, uh, of the U.S. on China, it's not bad for China that wants to enter a new phase of um, economic growth based on innovation. Is the trade war having an opposite effect on China that the U.S. might want? It's breeding innovation? Forcing innovation? I, I, I definitely think so, yeah. I, I, you know, frankly, I, I feel almost of a silver lining that I think to Chinese companies, so we see they're really, even the most conservative CBOs are now talking about artificial intelligence, talk about the digital transformation. You know, frankly, the Chinese economic growth has been slowed down uh, in recent years. It's now all of a sudden, it's now really just strictly affected by the, uh, the trade war. I think people understand and anticipate this uh, trade tension will continue. It's not going to be solved overnight, right? So that's something I think people start to digest that or already done that. At the same time, we're in the arrow, uh, Gansu, so-called epic disruption. That has been fundamentally shake up the economy, really, uh, you know, weakening a lot of uh, uh, companies. As we, as a consultant, we're in the market front. Uh, in a few years ago, you see we're working more onto the BAT-driven, the so-called new economy. They're bringing the changes, everything, right? So then there are like a group of companies hoping things will, you know, this is just one-time thing. Things are going to uh, pass by. But then now everybody seems like, listen to Jeffrey, I, I deeply feel, right, everyone is going into the deep, into the technology, go to the innovation. I think the Chinese economy will be resilient to, you know, the, the, the external factors by trying harder, right, the, uh, to, to innovate and develop the capabilities fundamentally. Uh, improving uh, their core competencies and also need to, uh, they're also building up the ecosystem, uh, you know, try to enable them to uh, uh, resist the, uh, the uh, uh, you know, the external factors. Uh, um, you know, we talk about, you know, there has been concerns about com companies, uh, uh, international companies moving their, their manufacturing bases uh, outside China. We see that, you know, inevitably probably happening. But at the same time, we also see uh, the uh, companies, uh, even the SMEs, are uh, trying really hard to build up the ecosystem, improving their digital supply chain to, uh, you know, taking the defensive mode and also uh, strengthen their capabilities. And this is a question for Paul as well as you. I mean, what happens, if, and I'm the journalist, so I think the worst case scenario, I mean, if there's a true bifurcation of tech supply chains and there's a technology cold war as we head into 5G, which is going to be like the air we breathe, it's going to be everywhere, and who's going to control that? And that's an issue that has gone to the political realm, the political sphere. How do we advise companies to face this possible scenario, whether it's a Huawei and 5G or it's anything else that gets caught in the crossfire? Well, if, well before we kind of dive into that question, I, I, <laughs> what, I would just say, look, I think there is an inherent danger to use the old Cold War framework to describe the situation that we're in today. I mean, if you look at the height of the Cold War, I think that the total trade dollar amount between the Soviet bloc and the Western world amount to less than 20, 30 billion dollars. And it's mostly concentrated on natural gases and, and oil and natural gases. But if you look at today's world, um, as we, we talked about earlier, so many products are produced in multiple locations. It's really hard to label one product as being an origin of by a country. Um, so it's, it's going to be almost an impossible surgery to really uh, bifurcate the supply chain into two completely separate camps. You're already seeing it. Right. You're and, seeing right. It. Exactly. And, and so now going back to the question, I think at the end of the day, there will be some categories of products where national securities are truly a concern. And those will have, you know, governments will set requirements on where these products, um, uh, the suppliers of these products that can qualify. Uh, and we've seen that 
the negative may, list. May, China has its negative list as far as the, the sectors that can come in here. They're shrinking that. And right. But I think ultimately they, they are components that frankly are, you know, I think that the issue about national security is warranted. And but that list is right now, frankly, being leveraged on other, you know, for other purposes. Right. So in reality, we, we think so on the long term, they will be a category of, of, of products that will, um, and that every country will want to have some sort of uh, self-reliance. Uh, but, but I will say, by and large, most of the technology products we use, I mean, 5G has been mentioned many times, I think it, it just does not make economic sense to have completely two different standards. Um, and, and, it, and frankly, I'm not even sure it's practicable to have two separate standards. Uh, there are so many IPs that are owned by American companies, Chinese companies, European companies, and if you were to put them apart, that already does is delay the 5G implementation. Well, that's the point. Uh, right, and, and then we'll have to duplicate a lot of different processes. So I think, you know, I think, what, I think when we all come to our senses, um, you know, I think there will be a different classifications of technologies, some of which will, you know, certainly have that national security concern be considered, and then the other will just be commercial items. Oh, yeah. I just want to raise a counterpoint. What's so bad about competition? Airbus versus Boeing. Yes, it's very costly when you have increasing returns to scale to have, you know, more than one company, but there's competition. But look what's happening, though. The governments are getting involved, and the Trump administration is levying tariffs on the EU because of subsidies, perceived subsidies, unfair. Just another round of another four billion, I don't know, I can't even remember, is it four billion of cheese and European exports because of the perceived subsidies and unfair subsidies given to Well, and I'm talking to about technology Airbus. competition. I'm talking, once this, you know, wave of uncertainty is resolved, technological companies being com competing with each other is not necessarily a bad thing. But then there's the license holders, whether it's Qualcomm or Android, Google, you, you have these, they become national interest issues. So there's a lot of issues that you have to deal with. But we don't want just one, maybe, anyway, we don't, we, we don't necessarily want one uh, monopoly around the world. That's yeah. all I'm saying. Okay. So, yeah. What's this all going to mean for cross-border M&A? The risk appetite for that. Paul? Oh. Well, look, I think, you know, the Chinese government is making a conscious effort to open up some markets. And we've seen that some of the announcements came out last week. Uh, so we would expect more uh, investment in these areas that are formally restricted. Uh, to foreigners. And so I would say, um, you know, in sectors like financial services, uh, telecommunications, um, uh, they, there will be more foreign investments into the country. Um, and on the, uh, you know, China outbound, we see uh, more Chinese companies thinking about establishing uh, operating bases outside. So they will kind of mostly take in the form of investments rather than the outright acquisition of foreign, foreign companies, uh, which uh, has, has been way down the last two or three years. Initially, it was restricted by the Chinese government, and then later on being restricted by the foreign governments, worrying about um, many of their more iconic companies being bought by Chinese. Um, so we think the M&A, in terms of acquisition, um, outbound, uh, is continued going to be um, at a low level, but there will be more sort of operating investments, if you will. Uh, that actually will, uh, we see, we, especially in ASEAN countries like Vietnam, Thailand, Indonesia, Philippines, I think that, uh, I think that will continue to rise. Jeffrey, uh, we know the dairy industry has gone through, you know, 10-year recovery phase from the melamine crisis that we saw a decade ago. And you've had an opportunity in those 10 years to consolidate. Basically, you and E. Lee Dairy have almost 50% of the domestic market. So now that you've You've, you've really seized that uh, market share here. And given the overhang of the global trade tensions, what is your risk appetite for going abroad? Well, we have um, uh, made uh, a significant effort, I think, in the last couple of years on basically raising our capability in managing quality and food safety. There's a tremendous job having done to really upgrade you know, if you look at really the way we do in the farms, like digital farms, that we are actually transform like smart factories, we do smart logistics, cool chains, so all the effort have significant improve 
the capability to manage quality in such a large scale. You know, we are shipping like 30 billion, 30 billion pack of product each year. To manage that level of amount, long supply chain, at the same time to really uh, manage a, a high quality level, give us the confidence on first quality, second, the capability to innovate. If you look at the market today, uh, if you talk to our supplier even today, like Tetra Pak, whatever, they will tell you that the most advanced machine are in China. Most of their prototype was made together with us in China. 20 years ago, they are taking the Chinese custom to Europe and US to see the most advanced machine. Today, they are taking customer to China to see where do we have in our factory in terms of the new uh, innovation. So these two, I think, give us a very high confidence to go out. That's the reason why, actually, in the ASEAN market, we start to expand. We have our first factory uh, last year in Indonesia, Jakarta, where we actually are making product and also <coughs> marketing those product in the Indonesia market. And we have seen very, very positive result because high quality, because very in innovative product, and the way we manage those, um, those business are, are really different. And we are able to also localize. If you go to Indonesia, you will see we only have like 5%, 10% people are from China. The rest are really localized. We have a factory in New Zealand. I only send one guy in New Zealand. The rest are in New Zealand. I have a factory in Australia. And I don't even have one, you know, people from, you know, uh, China, and they all manage by local people. So I think if you look at the technology, if you look at the quality perspective, innovation perspective, and also the way that we are able to really manage a team in the local culture, that we today have much more confidence to go out. And I see not only Meng Yu, but other Chinese company have the same phenomenon that how we are able to go out. Have you overcome the perception gap of the quality issues from 2008? And when you go abroad, these issues do come up, right? Well, to, um, actually, I would say not, not really. We are in Indonesia, we are in, even in Hong Kong and Singapore today in, in yoga business, we are growing very strong in, in Singapore and Hong Kong. And it's, the, the main reason is because we always want to go there with the best product, yeah. the premium product, high quality innovation. So that changed the perspective. Yes, in, in, in probably China and some uh, part of the you know, countries, we still have a, you know, a continuous effort to do, to raise, really raise up um, the perception. I would say it's just a perception. But when you look at the way we are doing business, the brand, the product, the quality, it's there. So yes, we will spend time, and probably in the next few years, we have to continue to spend effort right. on that. But I, I feel that we are, we are on the right, right direction. So you're saying through technology, you've been able to plug those gaps in the supply chain that we saw in 2008. Um, there were many cottage industry farms. There'd be a one farmer, one cow that you would collect from this and that. But now you can track everything through technology and everything, right? Yeah, you no longer see that. You will see that KKI actually can sell. They help us to build the biggest farming uh, company in China where we're producing like a million tons of milk each year. It's so not, that's not a paid advice. <laughs> I mean, are these the kind yeah. of things that yeah. Accenture is being asked to help yeah. Chinese I, companies? You know, in your risk averse, you don't want to necessarily spend on something you don't know is going to have a return. But obviously, Meng Niu is seeing yeah. a great return on the investment well, in tech. Yeah, I, I definitely echo to what uh, Jeffrey was saying right now. You see two things. Uh, the two data will show that. First is, uh, I think China presents the highest investment amount in R&D and also, uh, uh, you know, the innovation in history. Right. And then secondly, even you look at the uh, FDI, the outbound uh, FDI is still quite substantial. Uh, steady growth last year is about, you know, uh, four or five percent, and the inbound also is coming. The, the fact is, uh, much of the investment are uh, much more into the innovation. All right. So even like Accenture opened the, our Shenzhen Innovation Center uh, two months ago, and also the Shanghai Digital Lab just last month. Uh, 
for that investment, so we're you know, really try to support or uh, really help to support the Chinese companies to build up or expand their capabilities innovation, right? This is uh, the demand, the customer requirements, mm. that's how we're there, right? That reflects the uh, determination and the commitment of the Chinese companies into the R&D, into the innovation, into, you know, uh, it's not just Huawei, it's just every company yeah. in China talk about innovation, uh, digital transformation there. Professor Jin, um, following up on what they are saying, uh, you, you said something very interesting recently. You said, and I quote you, China sees itself less as slotting into an existing system and more as a creator and shaper of a new system. And as this plays out with their investments in the Belt and Road and other ambitions, you even said it begs the question, who is integrating whom? So in the new world order, if you will, who is integrating whom? I really think that given the circumstances, um, we really need to sit back and really uh, raise a few fundamental questions. Uh, the U.S. trade tensions is also a reflection of the problems of globalization. This is not just about trade, uh, the issues of income inequality, um, but it's also about financial globalization. What the city of London wants, what the governments, the business sector of the governments want is not fundamentally necessarily consistent with what people want around the world. And financial globalization has caused a lot of crises, um, uh, emerging market crises in particular. So in that framework, China wants to, China was slotting into the global system as it is in the early uh, few decades because it was carefully listening to the rules and trying to learn the rules and trying to be a good participant. But um, in the last 20 years or so, or especially in the last 10 since the 2009 uh, crisis, um, uh, there's been more and more questions about whether the existing economic, monetary, uh, financial architecture is a sound one. And here's an opportunity for China to really shape it. Uh, so China's no longer just slotting in, but China being also one of the largest economies in the world on its way to becoming the largest will have an enormous impact uh, on the world. So it's raising questions, although it hasn't found solutions, exactly what we need to do about the WTO, uh, how to, uh, and China here is doing a lot in terms of helping with the liquidity issues in emerging markets where the IMF fails, where the, the Fed that has central bank swap lines with only six advanced economies, there's a big gap in emerging markets, the Belt Road. It is doing uh, um, its part in filling that gap, but I wouldn't say there's a compre comprehensive answer to where that. Because there's already pushback. There's a pushback to this reshaping. Look what's happening in the streets of Hong Kong. Look what's happened in Sri Lanka or in Malaysia to push back to the debt diplomacy of China. And it's a perception issue, but it's also real. Uh, the former treasurer of Australia, Peter Costello, said, if Australia has to choose between economic prosperity and security, it will choose security. Are, are we faced with that scenario as well, that we have to choose between different ways? I mean, they're ideologically different and different economic models as well. Is that where we've come? And you said we like to have choice. Is that the devil's choice? It will be very costly, just as we've mentioned, to have a complete divide, division of trading system, technology system, and where countries are asked to choose sides. And by the way, uh, multinational banks, multinational companies might be asked to choose sides. That would be a very, very um, bad uh, direction to go, but it's plausible. It's possible. Yeah. It is possible. Question time from the audience. We've, come on. <laughs> Have I not been provocative enough? Here we go. I can be more provocative. Yong uh, Yang from Chongqing Sokang Industry Group. Uh, we are a automotive or OEM and uh, taking initiative into uh, intelligent electric vehicle um, uh, field. Um, I view the global economy as a, a gearbox. And uh, big economy is just like a big wheel. And a smaller economy is just like smaller wheels. And uh, they couple together. And uh, in order for the gearbox to work in a harmonious way, the, slow, the, the big economy can only run slower, and the small, you know, smaller economy can grow faster. 
And uh, when China was a small economy, it could grow at a double digit. But uh, now China has become the second largest economy. When it remains coupled with other economies, can Chinese economy still grow at a, a fast rate, like 6%? And uh, what, 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 what's your question? Can, the, can Chinese economy can still grow at a fast rate, like a 6%, like the government is targeting? Well, and when, when the economies remain coupled with uh, other big, you know, other economies. Right, I mean, I think the hyper growth phase of China, of seeing 13, 14% growth is over, obviously. I mean, it's a much larger uh, economy right now. But we're looking at, you know, if the full escalation of this trade war, or even where it is right now, Bloomberg Intelligence <laughs> expects fourth quarter to be 5.8%, this year 61 it's hard to figure out completely because the numbers are with, always within the range given by Li Keqiang, but what do you think? Well, I think that we, if we look at the longer term, let's move away from the trade war, there are reasons to be optimistic. Urbanization is a bit more than halfway done, still room to go. China is still a developing country by a GDP per capita measures, and there's convergence room. We talked about the youth generation and technology innovation. However, I want to point out uh, one, um, one, one thing to be cautious of is when we invest a lot in innovation, it does take time before that innovation translates into productivity where we actually see it in the data. So I believe in this what's called the J-curve, where you invest, invest a lot, and you see low productivity for a long period of time, which is what we're seeing actually around the world right now, before it picks up. So I think longer term, we should be um, kind of optimistic about China, given the human capital, the education system. Um, but the numbers, as reflected in the GDP growth rate, I'm not so sure. Right. Well, I, I just want to share two, two factors, right? First is that you look at the Chinese economy, we all agree that the economic growth was slowed down, but the substance it was still there. Last year, China had about 1.33 trillion uh, uh, dollars uh, on e-commerce, right? That's a huge, uh, it accounts about 42% of the world e-commerce. So that's a huge, it's very powerful, right? That continued growth, right? And then at the same time, people say, wow, you know, the Chinese gro growth, we see that uh, is largely by digital consumer, right? The next wave, we clear, is come to the B2B. You know, the, the effort into the supply chain, effort into really the quality of the manufacturing, digitalization of the manufacturing, that will bring more power to the engine, right? It's not gearbox, it's the engine pushing the economy grow. That will push the economy go much more faster, much more, uh, you know, much more solid, I would say. That, that's, that's very essential. Mm. What about you guys? I mean, are you seeing that this slowdown, if you will, in China uh, is reflective of a fundamental issue? I mean, it is stimulus driven in the first quarter. Are there legs still, though, if China has to, you know, grow but without stimulating? Because that creates asset bubbles. Well, I, I can't comment on the quarter to quarter development. Uh, but what we're seeing is, um, is that I think the, the, the percent of GDP growth, that number uh, itself is, is less meaningful. What's more meaningful is the makeup of that GDP growth. I think in the past, most of the GDP growth come from fixed asset formations, um, mm -hmm. uh, real estate being the, uh, the, a big part of that. Now, what we're seeing more and more now is that the consumption is primarily going to be a driver going forward in terms of growth. And this is something about, you know, we talk about within the KKR uh, firm <clears throat> about the effect of millennials. Uh, Asia will have more millennials than America and Europe combined. And what's also different is that we are the first millennial class that has higher disposable income than their parents. And that's different from the millennials that we find in America and Europe. And that creates a, a really a bad rock for consumption and consumption growth. That we can talk about how they invest, uh, how they, how they uh, behave as consumers are gonna be very different, but I think the, the sheer volume is gonna create a large room for GDP to continue to grow in the consumption side. And they're drinking milk, right? <laughs> well, uh, I, actually, I, I want to come with uh, uh, another angle. When I was at the breakfast meeting with some of the uh, professors from, from China, and we have discussed that. Uh, several things to share. I think, obviously, one, Paul has just said, the continuous local consumption is strong. 
Second, if you look at actually the service sector of China, there is a lot of room to improve productivity, particularly in the area of health and education. So with the you know, continued open of, of China, the, the service industry will continue to owe, you know, improve its productivity. That will bring back efficiency, and that will help the economy. That's the second part. The third part is 5G, because if this will have a significant amount of investment at the same time to help majority of the industry to improve our efficiency. Even on us, if you look at the digital transformation of our business, the 5G will play an important role in that. So if you add these three together, which is strong consumption, um, improve on service, you know, in terms of productivity, with openness in, in particular in the health and education area, and then the third, which is 5G. If you add these together, you know, I feel that the growth of, of China GDP will still remain at a relatively high level. I don't know whether it's 6 or 6.1, 6.2, but this is probably in the next few years, it's still, you can see that. So, you know, I feel that if you have these things happening, which is, you know, uh, at the moment, uh, I feel that we don't need to worry about if this is 6.1 and 6.2. If someone has the mic already, then we'll come down here. Yeah. Hi, my name is uh, Bruno Ben Said. I run a uh, small advisory firm called Shahivas doing cross-border m and I got two questions. Uh, one is for Paul and one is for everybody. Uh, Paul especially. How do you see uh, the new star board? I mean, what signal is it giving us? If it's going to you know, succeed or fail, what do you expect from the new board um, in terms of maybe cleaning up the mess of Xin uh, Sanban? Uh, perhaps, and uh, giving confidence to investors again. Uh, second question, do you see relevant any more cross-border M&A, especially to Europe and the US? Is it still useful? Uh, now that we are talking about, you know, different worlds, uh, you know, operating perhaps a little bit more independently, although the supply chain is, is connected, uh, is because I'm worried about cross-border because this is my bread and butter. Uh, so I want to understand if Chinese companies are still going to keep going overseas or are we going to see a different movement and what is, what is going to happen and is it going to be important, you know, what's gonna, what is it going to tell us? Thank you very much. Well, uh, I'll, uh, thank you for the question. I'll, I'll take a stab at this first. Um, in terms of the new board, um, you know, I think we've been telling our portfolio companies uh, when they're thinking about exit venues. Uh, many of our technology, especially I think our TMT related companies, that US capital markets have been the primary uh, way of uh, creating a listing uh, status and, and thereby an, an exit route. Um, more and more we see uh, Chinese companies start thinking about other viable uh, venues other than NASDAQ or NYSE. Um, and I think the new board uh, that's created, uh, it's really geared towards a, a Chinese version of NASDAQ, right? And, and, a, um, and whether that would attract uh, many of the good Chinese companies that are currently thinking about going to U.S. or other Western markets. And so that could be a possible uh, a venue. Now, would this lead to, a, again, a bifurcation of capital markets? We don't know. And, and certainly, I think the U.S. investors, at least right now, are a lot more familiar with more futuristic businesses, you know, companies that are not currently making a profit, but currently has a lot of a potential. So we're seeing a much bigger audience in the U.S. capital markets than, than we have here in Asia. Um, but would that change? We don't know. But clearly, uh, you know, having a, a, a viable alternative uh, is always good. So I, I mean, Hong Kong is, has been changing its listing the, rules. Yeah, the, the uh, class shares. Right. They, they are attracting. Alibaba is likely to come back, and others could delist from New York right. or uh, just have secondary listings. But they, the trend to move back here, right. is that being driven by the push to come home because of the bifurcation, or is it well, I, I think, look, just happened to this pool? Yeah. Look, I think a lot of people think there's some national agenda 
um, you know, having these exchanges. And, you know, there are some regulations. I think there were some comments made by a congressman uh, in the U.S. about that America must have the rights to audit the Chinese company's books if they were listed uh, in the U.S. I mean, there are some noises around that. But I'm, I fundamentally believe that companies make commercial decisions where to list at the end. I mean, some businesses are just better suited to be listed uh, in China or Hong Kong, and some are better in the U.S. I think fundamentally at the end is where your investor audience uh, um, uh, are aggregating, I guess. Um, 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 so, so I would say, you know, would this be, uh, would, is there some national agenda behind it? Probably. But I would say fundamentally for a board to be successful, it must provide commercial value uh, to these companies. Now, now to your second question. Cross border. About, yeah, cross border. Look, we, the first wave of China outbound M&As were actually led by SOEs, and they were focused primarily on national resource, uh, natural resources. And then the, within the second wave was by private sector companies looking to buy technology brands. Um, and I think going forward, you will see, you know, continue, I mean, I think you're going to see a pushback on technology and brand. Um, because I think other foreign, com you know, countries are also worried about their iconic companies being purchased by the Chinese. Uh, the Civius is a big barrier to many Chinese companies looking to buy uh, businesses overseas. But, however, we are seeing more and more of Chinese companies that are going out there not to buy brand and technology. And, and frankly, a lot of technology now, I think China, uh, homegrown technologies are probably even more superior than what the technology that they're competing with overseas. But now I think the focus is more shifting to channels. So they're buying customer base, buying channels, um, and also being investing in production base. So, you know, um, Monio is one example. In Australia, New Zealand, they're buying uh, customer base. They're buying access, right? They're, they're building production cap capabilities. So I think the focus has been sh shift from firstly SOEs on natural resources, then to bring technology and brands, and now is to more customer access um, and um, production base. And frankly, that's not that different from other multinational companies, if you right. think about it. I think China companies are going to be acting more and more like multinationals than, than in a separate category. Anybody else want to stab at that? We'll go to the next question. Okay. 12 minutes. I'm like the Shinkansen train. We're going to end on time, so. My, na my name is Martin uh, from Temenos. Uh, I got a question in regards uh, to the title of the session, which is the Asian view, and we have more or less exclusively been discussing about the Chinese view. So my question is, uh, are there any, uh, what is happening in the rest of Asia? Are there any winners or losers based on the current uh, frictions of, uh, between China and the US, Vietnam, India, what's happening with ASEAN? Do you have any views on that I mean, we talk part about, of Asia? We talk about Vietnam. I mean, it has one of the youngest populations in all of Asia, whereas Japan has one of the eldest. And even China, that age, I don't remember what they call it, but the, 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 the number of working age people in the next 30, 40 years is going to flip over on China. But young economies like Indonesia and also Vietnam, what do you guys think? Yeah? Well, first of all, I think with... Um, trade tensions between East and West, there's a stronger regional uh, trade, potential trade integration within Asia, and most of the trade happens locally within the region. So that's really important. That, that comes down to whether the leaders of the region can push for stronger trade ties within uh, that region. But as I've mentioned before, some of these shocks acts as an accelerator. It will accelerate the moving of the lower end manufacturing, uh, low skilled kind of production to countries like Vietnam and Bangladesh, lower cost, and accelerate that process of, um, uh, of supply chain shifts. Um, but that said, I think generally, at least in the short term, most of the Asian economies will suffer from the trade tensions, uh, especially because of the uncertainty in the business environment. You looking, are you looking, Jeffrey, are you looking at well, other Well, actually, if you, we just did a, a strategic map for the rest of Asia, it will be fine, interesting, for, uh, if I have to use just one simple description. If you, you see a, a younger China, in a way, 
uh, in the rest of the Asia, and particularly in the ASEAN market, when you look at a population of 650 million people, they are younger than China. They need investment, uh, and it's growing quite steadily. Um, even from a dairy sector perspective, the consumption continue. It was, it, it was m most of the country are not a, a dairy drinking history kind of a country, but if not only dairy, but all for the rest of the consumer goods, it's the same trend that it is really steadily growing, very robust, young uh, millennia, young population, um, household income is, is, is growing, and also, importantly, political side, it's much more stable, I would say, in the, in the recent years. So <clears throat> this will add, again, for us, it's another strong lag of uh, growth uh, for future. Okay. Down here in the front. I'll try to get in the back. Okay, we will when we talk about a trade, I think for the scale of the goods trade, uh, America and China almost have a similar scale or uh, somewhat the same. But for the service trade, I think for China, it's only half of the U.S. scale. And uh, in China, I think the government also have intentions to develop the service trade. I know Mr. Zhu and Accenture is the biggest service uh, agency uh, I think it, it globally, right? So can you provide some kind of experience? And I also know that in, in Dalian, uh, the IT outsourcing is a very big pillar of business in Dalian. So any advice from other uh, is also very uh, yeah. good to know. We Thank know you. services take up more than half of the economy here, or more than manufacturing. Yeah, well, I think clearly, I, I think uh, the Chinese economy is uh, shifting more into the service. Uh, in Dalian, actually, we have over 10,000 people uh, primarily doing the uh, technology and uh, business service outsourcing. I, I see the market is still growing uh, very rapidly uh, in, in, in China and also across the region. Uh, overall, uh, that is, you know, again, the composition of the, uh, uh, the economy actually is shifting much more on the surface, uh, on the sur uh, service orientation. Uh, you know, people may think this is a reason for that we have such a also in business it was because we have a relatively cheap labor. Actually, the things are changing as well, right? Now in uh, Dalian, right, we, we apply RPS uh, robots a lot into our service uh, automation quality, right? That, that really, you know, again, you look at the, the economy, you cannot just look at the size, you cannot just look at the number, you have to look at the substance, what's in there. In there, there's a substantiated changes every day in this country, in this economy, in every company we're serving, right? So that is really pushing the economy moving uh, to a much more healthier, much more market-driven, much more transparent uh, uh, stage. Uh, that's how I see the power of Asia right now. We talk about Southeast Asia as well, right? Now, I think, I, I think it's a, a Malaysian uh, premier was talking about two elephants are fighting, you know, the animals around or even grass are being affected, right? But this is a good and bad, right? We see uh, I think countries are benefited from the, uh, uh, a lot of changes here in, in, in China because of the e-commerce e is pushing much more downward to uh, Southeast Asia. There, there's more trade or business uh, realignment in <coughs> the region in there, right? So the question is, uh, it's not really uh, anything absolute. It, it is really up to how the country or the company, uh, how you want to do, right? What are you gonna do? You cannot just wait to see what's, what's gonna happen. You have to be on your own to decide, prepare, anticipate, right? To do things, uh, then to uh, mitigate uh, that risk. And then the opportunity will come. Frankly, I see it's still a great opportunity in front of all of the, uh, uh, not just China, in Southeast Asia countries as well, uh, or also in Indian, uh, in, 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 in all those countries across Asia. I promised a question in the back there. The Thank gentleman you. there, and then we'll come over. Thank you. Um, 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 my question is regarding the trade war between U.S. and China. Um, you know, China we know is suffering, and the U.S. is suffering one way or another because a lot of Americans should know manufacturer job is not moving back to U.S. You know, is they're moving to uh, India, Vietnam, Bangladesh, right? Uh, so my question is, do you think U.S. and China will ever reach a comprehensive trade deal? And uh, it's not just a beginning of new form of a uh, Cold War, um, you know, especially from uh, U.S. point of view. You know, it's a two uh, country yeah. with uh, different ideology, different system, different culture. 
Um, so this is my question to all the uh, uh, panelists. Thank you. So Steve Mnuchin, the U.S. Treasury Secretary, says we're 90 percent there to a deal. <laughs> is a 90 percent deal better than no deal, or what's going to happen? Anybody? <laughs> Nobody? I, well, I, I think the, uh, well, as a consultant, right, uh, we, we always uh, advise our clients uh, to prepare for all weathers, right? You, you cannot uh, dream something happens next day. Uh, you, you can anticipate things may take time, and there, there may not be a perfect answer, right? So I think this uh, dialogue will probably continue. This uh, trade tension will still continue, right? I think you see a company is rising, that another company is still very powerful. This has been a lot of uh, interactions. Uh, but eventually, uh, there will be an equilibrium achieved. There will be something reached over the time. This is a uh, how I, we feel uh, very you know, optimistic on, on that outcome, right? But then uh, the question is how through that process of what you can do, right? What you can um, uh, do for, 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 for your company, your business. Uh, I think that's, uh, that's very, very uh, crucial. The problem is there's the red lines on both sides right. that they won't cross. Um, what China has learned uh, in the last few months is that uh, by appearing a bit too eager to have a deal done, making too many conciliatory steps to uh, maintain comity was not necessarily a good strategy, at least in dealing with a person like President Trump. So my guess is that we're going to see this tit for tat kind of back and forth for a while, because you've got to ask, what is the incentive to make it, um, make the trade deal done? Now China's strategy is, let's just play it cool. Let's sit back and let's play it cool because if the trade war actually hits the economy in the U.S. Neg you know, bad enough so that Trump needs to get a deal done before the re-elections, then we'll come back to the table and renegotiate. But until then, just trying to offer new steps forward and this and that didn't buy that much. So I think the current strategy, at least as, as is played, seems to suggest that there will be some, uh, some time before this really gets completely resolved kick the can down the road and see what the, see what the election that. happens, <laughs> what happens in the election, yeah. Um, over here, far right. Hi, so there, there's been a lot of talk about efficiency and you know, technology um, going into the supply chains. What happens to jobs? I mean, the country needs to employ people, so if we move towards a more automated world, right. jobs are the key to economic growth, it's key to the consumer that everyone talks about. Yeah. So in the near term, what do you see happening to that consumption story as companies are making these productivity improvements? That's a great question because that goes into demographics as companies go into more automation. Governments like job creation. Look at the PMI subindex on employment sank to the lowest level here in China t since 2009. So what's going on? What's, how are we going to keep jobs but still go automation? Well, you know, I, I think Accenture has a study. We're looking at what artificial intelligence could do, right? We're seeing that the economy will grow. Our, our forecast is by year 2035, there will be 1.6% GDP generated by artificial intelligence, which actually brings also opportunities uh, to the jobs as well, right? Now, people are going to say, this is just your assumption. What's it really going to happen, right? What we see is that automation replacing uh, the people, right? Now, like, even in our Dalian uh, outsourcing centers, uh, what we're eliminated is that the jobs are doing the boring repetition, repetition type of stuff, right? So people will be afraid to do something more, um, more high end, uh, or more, uh, you know, require more human uh, uh, involvement. Uh, so the the, the uh, you know actually we have uh, published the book uh, uh, in recent months uh, uh, called the Human and Machine. It, it addresses that, that between the automation and the people, there is a middle. Uh, area. We're actually creating a lot of opportunities uh, for the human to link with the machine, training, uh, emotional affection, you know, involvement uh, into the, uh, the workforce. Uh, there are a lot of uh, new opportunities created uh, to, uh, uh, you know, actually to the economy. I, I see this as uh, not uh, uh, something negative, but much more po po uh, positive, but that going to take uh, a, a bit of time and yeah. transformation there. I always like to give the final minute, final thoughts. You came here to the panel with, you wanted to say something but didn't get to. Final thoughts, Jeffrey? Well, um, I would say just back to that uh, question on creating jobs. I think, you know, it's always that the perception and also the willingness to, to invest, the capability to innovate that will bring more uh, jobs and bring more, you know, energies to to drive.
the economy uh, grows. So I think this is probably the l one last quote I will have. leads to more jobs. Paul? Well, just build on that, I, I think maybe a word of comfort is that don't worry, the economy will find a way. Um, you know, we've seen technology automation as early as a couple hundred years ago, and people still stay full employed. So I think that I think the key is education, is to train our uh, uh, labor force to adopt, uh, adapt a, a different uh, skill set. I think that's what uh, uh, paramount. In my household, I always give the final word <laughs> to the ladies. Uh, talk less, <laughs> do more, strengthen your own countries, and there will be no war between the countries. Ladies and gentlemen, please put your hands together for the wonderful panelists, and thank you very much.